All right. Okay. Let me get the lights and whatnot adjusted. TV's uh, turning on. Hopefully everything works. Okay. Looks like it is working. I actually left my clicker uh, uh, in my bag. Uh, I take it with me whenever I travel, so I had it in another bag, So, but I'll just use a keyboard. It'll be all right. Okay, um, so let's get started. Uh, first off, a little bit of housekeeping. I really don't like canceling class as, as much as I am, but I'm actually going to have to cancel class on Tuesday as well. <laughs> um, for one, yeah, yeah, I can, I can see, your, I can see the, the emotional devastation in your eyes. <laughs> um, um, so... Uh, the, the idea is so I actually I just have to go out of town for one day so so you folks in structural analysis you don't you don't get the the class cancellation so, so yes 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 so homework four is d still due Tuesday um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> homework four is still due on Tuesday I'm just gonna have you all turn it in on the cart and instead of there being a box, there's literally nothing on the cart now, so just throw it on the cart and I'll have somebody collect it at 12.30. So make sure that you get that turned in. Since it is due on Tuesday, I guess I'll open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions about the homework assignment? I've gotten a couple of them by email. Did everybody get my responses? There was a question on, what was it, the, the big one? It doesn't meet the minimum. Yeah, so, so then you would use the minimum. So I made up a number. I said, if you calculate, let's say, 550 pounds and the minimum is 564, you go with the 564. And let's be clear what that does to your mix, okay? If you up your cement content, what does that do to your water-cement ratio? Think about that. What's that? It goes down. If your water-cement ratio goes down, what happens to your compressive strength? It goes up, so it's a conservative uh, approach, right? So you don't have to change anything else? No, no. No, because based on that initial set of ingredients, you're going to do a moisture correction later. And but, you know, keep in mind, you're determining weights of coarse aggregate, water, and cement. And then after that, what you're doing is you're taking those quantities, and you're saying, well, how much sand do I need to obtain one full cubic yard? You see what I mean? So you're obtaining the, the right quantities, uh, you know, at the end. And then again, once you're done with that, you do your moisture correction. So, um, you, did you have a question? Um, yeah, on the second problem, the Yeah. Is it like an accurate calculation or is it just essentially? Okay, so my plane landed. I didn't get home to like 1 o'clock in the morning, so I don't remember what you're talking about. Let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have their book with them? All right. Um, well, first off, it says compute the required weight of coarse aggregate per cubic yard. So what is that weight that it's giving you? Like it tells you this. Is it like the adjusted? Yes, yes. Um, What's that? How do you find the weight of water if it doesn't give you the weight of cement? So Don't you get that from your slump? You have a three-inch slump, right? Yeah. So based on your three-inch slump, you can determine the weight of water, right? Am I missing something? No, right here, isn't that? I mean, that's what step six is, right? Based off of your... Essentially, yeah. Does that make sense? I'll look over it in a little more detail. In case I'm completely out of it, I'll, I'll send you an email. Everybody okay with this? All right. One thing I'll mention, and I'm just going to show you something uh, uh, for lab. Uh, I figured you all would get a kick out of this. We are going to do a moisture correction 
for the ingredients for our mix. And in order to do that moisture correction, you need absorptions. I'm actually using your absorptions, okay? These, these absorption values, and we'll talk about this in lab today, but these absorption values are actually averages of what you obtained in the lab, okay, for the course in fine aggregate. So I figured that'd be a nifty little, uh, uh, nifty little aspect. So, but we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to lab session later on. Everybody okay with this? So there. Uh, speaking of the absorption, if I remember correctly, I think the course aggregate absorption everybody's was pretty much dead on accurate. They were pretty close to one another, within like half a percent. But the fine aggregate, the one with the sand cone, there were two groups that had some like seven, eight percent values, and then everybody else had what like, ones. So I went with the ones. So, so I think it was group what, three and five, or like seven and eight percent or something, which was a little high. So, so, all right. A any questions? Okay. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about just some general aspects regarding um, successful concrete applications. Um, to give you all a, uh, another idea of what's to come, so uh, if you all recall last time in lab, uh, I talked to you all about the final, the lab report, the final homework, okay? We'll, we'll I guess, technically say that's assigned today, but that, that big lab report that I told you all about, that's not going to be due until like, December because, I mean, we're going to be testing cylinders and whatnot throughout the remaining of, uh, remainder of the semester. So that's not going to be due till, uh, due till December. But I am going to give you one more homework assignment on uh, concrete. So you all have homework four, which is due on Tuesday. You have homework five, which is going to be, it's going to cover some stuff that we talk about today and some other uh, minor problems. That's going to be do a little bit later, and then your second exam will be on cement and concrete and those two homework assignments. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody okay on schedule? All right, so today what I want to talk about is just some general aspects of successfully applying concrete. I mean, we've already talked about some of this with the mix design, but I want to talk about things like handling and batching and, and stuff like that. Bless you. Transportation, curing, stuff like that. And then I want to talk about properties of hardened concrete. And some of this stuff for the properties of hardened concrete, uh, you folks who've had the, the worst professor ever for reinforced concrete design, you will recognize some of these uh, hardened properties. So, but we'll, we'll get to that uh, here in a little bit. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me see if the... Uh, so we'll save that. Looks like the recorder is working, so... I had to reinstall it though, like completely uninstall it and reinstall it. Okay, so let's talk about some, some basics on successful concrete applications. Now, we mentioned this at the very beginning when we talked about uh, Portland cement concrete, but successful, the successful application of concrete on some given project is going to be a function of a number of different uh, operations. Okay? We've already talked about the mix design. Okay? It all starts with the mix design, and we've gone through mix design applications from start to finish. Okay? And you all have a homework assignment where you're exploring that in great detail, and then you're also, you know, step two, where you're doing testing and trial mixes and things like that. We are doing that today. So, so you all will get uh, some firsthand experience on this. What I want to do is, is talk to you a little bit about the process of taking um, that mix design and going from you know, a mix design on paper to an actual application in the field. And if you have any type of experience with construction or you've been on construction sites and whatnot, a lot of this stuff is probably going to be somewhat familiar. You've probably seen a lot of this stuff uh, employed in the field. But I just want to give you all ju just a general idea. I I I'll go ahead and give you a disclaimer. I am not going to talk about every single potential concrete application that exists everywhere. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but I just want to give you all a general idea of some of the equipment, some of the methods that you're going to see uh, when you get out of here uh, with your degree. So, like I said, we've already talked about mixed designs and testing and whatnot. Let's talk about actual applications. So it starts off, you know, once you've got your design and your proportions, the first thing you're going to uh, begin to do is start batching and mixing, okay? So one thing I do want you all to, to uh, uh, retrieve from this is, you know, some of the terminology. When I use the term batching, what do I mean? When I use the term mixing, what do I mean? You know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink if we're celebrating. 
and, you know, I might say what is batching or what is mixing, so on and so forth. Okay? So what I mean by batching, batching in a nutshell is a concrete mix design. So let's say, you know, we do a mix design and we say for one cubic yard, we've got, you know, this much gravel, this much sand, so on and so forth. The client comes up and says, well, I need 50 cubic yards, so multiply it out, and then here's how much gravel you need, here's how much sand you need, so on and so forth. Batching is actually weighing those uh, components out for a given mix. That's what it means is to actually uh, 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 weigh out uh, those components. Now, uh, keep in mind, we are when we batch concrete, we are measuring our quantities by weight and, and not by volume. Okay, and the reason why is because measuring by weight is far more accurate than measuring by volume. I mean, you all know by now. I mean, let's go back to uh, let's go back to lab number one. Remember lab one when we were looking at unit weight? I remember there was the the two boxes of gravel. I remember one was loose and one was compacted. That was the same gravel. It was the same quantity, but one uh, was more densely occupying the box than another. Okay, makes sense that um, base. I mean, you all saw it. There was more gravel in the one box than there was in the other, and it occupied the same volume. The reason why is because based on that that aggregate, you know, being shifted around in a given container. You, you might obtain a, a, a different volume. But the weight, that isn't going to be affected by how the concrete is, or how the gravel or the sand is sitting in some container. The weight is the weight. And also, from, from a, a volume standpoint, um, let's keep in mind, we're going to take that gravel and take that sand, and we're going to introduce it into a concrete mix. Those voids, you know, let's say we're talking about gravel, those voids in between the, the particular elements in the gravel, they're going to be filled with sand and cement and water. So the air voids in some aggregate, they really don't matter. So that's why when we batch, we measure by weight. Even though we're trying to achieve a, a, a given volume, uh, we, we measure our quantities out by weight. Now, one thing you do have to recognize is the accuracy of measurement um, uh, with given scales. This is a rule of thumb for, for scale accuracy, but, but let, me, let me give you kind of an idea. Um, so when I was doing my PhD, I, I um, did a lot of large-scale experimental testing on some uh, representative bridge specimens. And we'd have some specimens in the lab, and we'd get them up to, you know, three, 350,000 pounds, easy, okay? Now, in order to measure those responses, we were using load cells. And a load cell is, and I've mentioned load cells before, but they're really nothing more than super-duper, hyper-fancy bathroom scales, you know? You apply a force, it records a response, okay? So in order to do those, uh, those laboratory tests and collect data, I needed load cells that could withstand you know, three, 400,000 pounds. Okay? Now, if you look at the data that those load cells were outputting, they were not outputting you know, 264,946.3286743 pounds. Okay? They weren't that accurate. In fact, the load cells that I was using for my laboratory experiments were only accurate to the nearest like one or two hundred pounds. So you go, well, that's not very accurate at all, but, but look at the scale. You know, you think, well, heck, the bathroom, the scale I have in my bathroom is more accurate than that. It can report at least to the nearest pounds, but that bathroom scale is not expecting to see 400,000 pounds. It's only expecting to see a few hundred. Its accuracy is relative to its range. You see what I mean? So you got, you got to keep that in mind. So a good, good rule of thumb is about 0.4%. Uh, now, one point that, that's, uh, that's worth mentioning, nowadays, concrete ready mix plants, all of your, your batching and whatnot is, is very highly computer controlled. You know, if you're looking at a particular mixing plant, you'll have, for instance, silos containing your Portland cement. You'll have water tanks, obviously, containing your uh, mixed water, aggregate bins for your, uh, your gravel and your sand. And basically, based on a given uh, concrete mix, a computer-controlled uh, computer machine will deposit the appropriate amounts of ingredients at the appropriate rates into a given mixing pan. So batching is weighing out your ingredients, mixing them is actually collecting them together and producing your concrete. <coughs> that will all be done uh, in a computer-controlled fashion uh, to achieve a given mix. I think I have a video on this. I pulled up a few. I don't want store from Microsoft. Goodness. I'm actually going to mute this. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a video from the Arizona DOT, and they're looking at a, uh, 
a batch plant where they're mixing concrete. This is going uh, for a particular road application. But here you can see the mixed plant, and I'm, uh, the video is going kind of fast, but you can see the individual ingredients being carried out for a particular mix. Now you're going to see a little bit of probably some stuff you didn't expect. For instance, the, the concrete isn't getting deposited into a uh, drum mixer truck. It's basically just getting deposited into a regular dump truck, and you'll see because of the, uh, the screw type uh, placement machine that they're using later. But the idea is, let me, let me see if I can pause this. Okay, so the idea is based on this given application, the concrete uh, ready mix plant is batching out the appropriate materials at the appropriate quantities, mixing them in this drum, and then depositing, depositing them in these trucks. And then the trucks are one by one going to the site. Um, if you have a really, really big project, I mean, it's not that unheard of to actually have batch plants or mobile batch plants on site. That's, that's very common on large scale civil engineering projects. That plant, the plant that we're talking about, I mean, look at this, this statistic. This plant makes enough concrete to build half a mile of road each day. That's a lot of concrete. That's a lot. Okay. Um, there's a couple of other things in this video that's worth, uh, worth mentioning. So uh, this is filling, you know, quite a bit of trucks, you know, 60 trucks an hour. This is going to become part of a loop uh, in Arizona. Now, you can see that the trucks are essentially just depositing the raw concrete onto the, um, onto the sub base. And then, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but um, what we have here, it's kind of like a bid well machine if you've ever uh, worked on a, uh, a bridge project. However, this, this screw method of depositing concrete is really more uh, applicable for road projects. And, and really projects that are very root based in nature, you know, the same profile uh, across a, a long given length. You can see, I mean, this, th that's the perfect image right there. So, you know, just a mess of concrete, screed, boom, you know, nice even surface. Then all you'd have to do from there is, you know, bull float it, you know, finish it off, and then you've got your, uh, got your application. Any questions about all this stuff? I mean, please, I want you all to, uh, to get the most out of this. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, batching is actually uh, weighing out your individual ingredients for a given mix. Mix is actually including those uh, ingredients together. So once you start, again, once the water comes into contact with the cement, clock starts, okay? So that's sort of the where, where you've got to keep your eye on, okay, when the initial uh, wetting time occurs to when you want initial and final set, okay? Now, usually when you start mixing a good, uh, uh, usually what happens is you'll start out with a, a small amount of water in the mixture and then everything is, you know, added in a controlled rate from then on, you know, usually 10% of the water, then the solids, then uh, for the most part, the rest of the water. What, what we're going to do in the lab is, we're, because we have such a small quantity, I mean, we're only talking about a little more than a cubic foot, we're essentially just going to dump it all in. I mean, we're going to dump it in, uh, you know, dump the, the, water, uh, the, the gravel, then the water, then the cement, and then the sand. But we're not, you know, dumping in, you know, small components. I mean, we're doing a little bit of control, but we're essentially just, there we go. Again, small quantities. So just something to keep in mind. Um, like I said, um, there are different, uh, different means of actually mixing concrete. What you have here on the right, this is a mobile batcher, and, and it's essentially a, a means of separating your individual ingredients, but in a, uh, a mobile fashion. So you can see on this one truck, we have a hopper for the cement, we have a water tank, we have a sand bin, we have an aggregate bin, then all that gets mixed, deposited onto the site uh, via a uh, a shoot, and I'm, I'm actually going to talk about uh, different placement methods uh, here later on. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Once you've got your concrete mixed, you then need to transport it. Again, that also depends on your project. If you've got a really large scale uh, application and you have a, you know, ready mix plant on site, well, you don't really need to worry too much about transportation. But in most cases, you do have to consider getting your uh, freshly mixed concrete from the mix location to its final, uh, to, or at least near to its, uh, its final set location. I'm just curious if, if everybody's paying attention. Anybody tell me the difference between these two concrete mix trucks? 
There we go. One, ha one has a front discharge, one has a rear discharge. So, um, you know, I, I think just about everybody in here has seen rear discharge trucks on the road before. They are op you know, arguably your most common. Front discharge trucks will allow you a little bit of uh, more freedom and flexibility that are a little easier uh, to maneuver um, for a given placement. Just something, something to consider. One of the things you're going to find with this lecture in general and just this topic in general is that there's you know dozens and dozens of ways to uh, to do this. You know, once you've got a given mix design, there's there's you know the possibilities to get that mix design to its finished location properly are, are almost endless. It's really just going to be a function of your given application, you know, local conditions, economy, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to give you a, a general idea of um, various different, different applications. One of the uh, other points that's worth mentioning is ASTM does uh, uh, have controls over the agitation and the mixing uh, that can occur within a truck for a given batch of concrete. For instance, you can't, um, you can't, you know, think about it like this. You can't, uh, let's say you've got a, a ready mix plant, you've deposited some concrete in a truck, you're transporting it to site, the drum is rotating at a controlled speed in order to ensure that, that concrete remains agitated. Do you think that concrete can sit in that truck for, you know, for 12 hours, 24 hours? Probably not. You know, even, even if we weren't worried about the concrete setting in the truck and then next thing you know we have to watch that Mythbusters episode where they, they <laughs> to throw the dynamite in the truck. <laughs> Anybody see that? Oh, that was pretty good. Alright, that was a pretty good episode. They, they blew that truck up, didn't they? Like, isn't that the one where they had to move like a mile and a half away from the blast radius? Again, any day with controlled demolition is a good day. It's, it's a general philosophy I tend to, uh, I tend to live by. Well, they had control over it. They hit the button. They were. <laughs> What's that? Well, we'll crush them. What's that? No. <laughs> it's worth a try. <laughs> um. Um. You know, I'm not going to go through every single ASTM standard that exists in, in, the, uh, in the book. We'd, we'd be here you know, for, for ages looking at that. Just recognize that there are limits, not just from an initial setting standpoint, but if concrete remains in a truck, let's say, too long, um, you're going to start to lose some of those desirable properties like workability, like you know, early strength and so on and so forth. Um, you know, when you get to the placement and the, the finishing stages. So there are limits on that. There are, you know, attachments, you know, you can have truck agitators that can keep your concrete agitated, which is a good thing, you know, if you need a little bit more time. But it's just something to, uh, uh, to keep in mind. Again, there's hosts and hosts of ways to, um, uh, uh, to mix, transport, etc. Once you've got your concrete on site, you know, you'll need to uh, usually draw some uh, representative samples to do uh, testing, to do slump, air content, temperature tests, you know, cast cylinders, do beams. That is my only slide on this, and there's really nothing on here. Why? We're going to do this. You know, we're going to do this here in a little bit. So we're going to be performing the full gamut of these experiments uh, you know, here today, so I don't really think there's much you know, worth of me sitting here talking about it in class, because we're going to do it hands-on here in a little bit. I'm going to move on from there. Okay, so Got your concrete batch, got it mixed up, got it there on site. Next thing uh, you need to do is you need to place that concrete. We do not pour concrete. We place concrete. We are engineers. Okay? We are uh, uh, interested in concrete placement. There are, again, hosts and, and, and numerous different ways to place concrete. What do I mean by place, placing concrete? I mean taking concrete from its you know, mixed state and getting it to its final location. I'm not saying get it in a finished state, I'm saying getting it to its final location. So for instance, if we're casting, let's say a bridge deck, I'm talking, and you've got, let's say, a, a, a concrete uh, rear discharge mixing truck, I'm talking about getting that concrete from the truck to the deck, okay? I'm not talking about screening or bull floating or anything, anything like that. Okay, so a couple things. Number one, uh, you typically want to limit your drop height to less than three feet. 
Y'all know what I mean when I say dry pipe? I'm talking about you do not want, uh, I mean, if anything, just from a safety standpoint, but from a quality standpoint as well, you do not want, you know, let's say here's your uh, discharge point, you don't want this a good 20 foot above the, uh, the deck. You're not going to, it's not going to be a desirable outcome in any way, shape, or form. You typically want to limit that to about three feet. I mean, if anything, just from a handle, uh, handleability standpoint. It's going to limit, uh, uh, it's one of the big reasons is you want to prevent segregation, okay? Um, anybody know what I mean by segregation? It, if you don't, what I mean by segregation, I, what I'm talking about is uh, a situation where your aggregates and your sand are getting sort of separated and you don't have that even uniform mixture within your concrete. That's not a very desirable outcome either because you're not going to get a, a, a quality uniform product uh, in the end. <laughs> it's also a concern when you use a concrete vibrator. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to uh, finishing stages uh, here in a little bit. Concrete vibrators are very nice to uh, get your concrete to fill all the nooks and crannies between the rebar and the form and so on and so forth, but you can't use it too long or you're, you'll start to separate your gravels and your sands from the rest of your mix and you'll have some weak spots, if you will. So you definitely want to limit that. Yes, sir. You can also rupture your forms, but that's the sort. Yes. No, no. You're talking about the hose? Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about from the, like, from that nozzle. That's a good question, though. Now, in terms of places, I mean, there's hosts of different ways. You can, I mean, you could go from a, just a wheelbarrow to a, a, a power buggy. Um, uh, you can use a, a placement crane in a bucket. When I did uh, uh, testing of specimens in the lab, this is actually what we used. We rented a, a three-quarter yard uh, bucket from uh, MPE uh, locally. The lab had an overhead crane. So what we did is we backed the truck up, filled the bucket, lifted it over, and the way these works, you have a handle right here, you just press down, shoot opens, and phew. so that's starting to get a little high on that placement. That should have, that should have been lowered a little bit. That's just my opinion. But that, that's one uh, very uh, popular means. Again, it just depends on the application. Um, <coughs> if, the, uh, if the geometry works and um, you've got the right uh, mixing truck, you can even just drive the truck right up to the location and begin uh, discharge. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you've got the geometry to make that work. Um, this is getting a, a little more on the, the, the fancy side. This is uh, actually having a truck and a pump and literally pumping the concrete out to the given location. This, again, this is a little on the fancy side, uh, but I mean, it is used. Um, I'd say for, for those of you who are um, uh, maybe considering doing work in the bridge world and in the, uh, uh, the bridge industry, this is probably one of the most common applications. You mentioned this. Have, have you done work, let's say, DOH or stuff like that and seen this before? How many folks have, have done DOH work and seen this, this type of concrete place before? This is a very common method of, uh, of placing concrete in the field, specifically for concrete decks. I actually took this picture on, uh, picture on a project I was working on uh, in Iowa, and I've got a couple other pictures uh, <coughs> of this project here in a little bit. But the idea is that uh, you've got your, uh, let's say your mixing truck, and it's agitating your concrete. When that begins to discharge, it essentially discharges on this, it's sort of like a conveyor belt, and the concrete will run on the conveyor belt, okay? And then right here, it will spill out and it will deposit into this, it's kind of like a fabric type tube, it's kind of like a canvas type tube, and you can see the, the, the operator can take that and, you know, maneuver that and place the concrete wherever it needs to be placed. Then the belt goes back and it just keeps going. It's a really uh, simple, straightforward, and, and versatile means of placing concrete, very popular for bridge applications. <coughs> um, if you've got road applications, you can use something like a screw spreader. That was what was mentioned in that video. You can have a, a raw, essentially rough pile of concrete, and then this mechanized process will evenly distribute that concrete uh, over a given uniform depth to obtain your desired uh, road profile. Now, one thing to keep in mind, <laughs> all of these methods for placement will get your concrete where it needs to go, but it will do so only in a, 
roughened capacity, in a roughened state. You will still need to do uh, finishing uh, down the line. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, once you've got your concrete uh, placed, you then need to consider consolidation. Now consolidation, it, if you want a, a general term for that, placement will get your concrete essentially where it needs to go. But consolidation is trying to ensure that your concrete fills all those uh, nooks and crannies, the voids in between the rebars, into the, uh, uh, the gaps between the rebar and the forms. That's a very uh, critical aspect. If you don't handle consolidation, you're going to get weak spots in your, uh, in your finalized uh, product. That's not going to be a very safe application. One very common way to consolidate concrete is to use a vibrator. You basically essentially have this motorized uh, metallic cylinder that will obviously vibrate. What you would do is insert that in a given location. What that will do will agitate that uh, concrete in that given localized, uh, uh, localized uh, place in your, uh, in your product and will spread that concrete out. Now you don't want to sit there and just you know, insert it and run it for, for, for you know, half an hour or you'll start to again separate your gravel and your sand from the rest of your concrete and you will, uh, uh, again, you'll create some weak spots. This is from the structures lab at WVU, the guy who's running that. He is such a dork, I can't stand that guy. That's me, sorry. <laughs> I love this stuff, it's so easy. But, um, but yeah, one of the things about, uh, about utilizing this equipment, you can separate your, your uh, particles from the rest of the mix and that will uh, achieve a desirable result. And then you can also rupture your forms, depending on the type of formwork that you're using. So you sort of want to watch out. So, you know, insert it, run it for about five or ten seconds, and then that's it. You're supposed to do that just enough so you can fill the voids, and that's it. Okay? Because I said that. <laughs> you didn't see that, though, right? You didn't see it. <laughs> see what, right? <laughs> Now there are also other options for consolidation. For instance, utilizing um, here I'm gonna go back here. Utilizing self-consolidating concrete. If you've ever seen concrete applications where you have a lot of uh, high-range water reducers, ever heard the term super P, super plasticizer? You don't typically need vibratory equipment in that uh, regards because that's what the concrete is for. It is mixed to be highly flowable so that you don't need uh, uh, that uh, that extra uh, equipment. Plus, it's also, you know, you have to consider your, your application. I mean, if you've got a really deep, let's say a really deep, really thin uh, placement, you know, if you're talking about a wing wall or some, you know, large, thin application, I mean, it's pretty difficult to uh, properly utilize a concrete vibrator if you're, you know, that deep in a very thin element. So utilizing self-consolidating concrete where the concrete mix itself can fill those voids is probably the most appropriate. Your mix gets a little fancier. You know, you've got different additives and, and water reducers and things like that. <laughs> uh, but in the end, uh, it might be necessary. But I, my big uh, point that I'm making here is that I want you to make sure that you need to address consolidating in some fashion. Either use a self-consolidating mix or use equipment to ensure that happens. We are going to consolidate the cylinders in the lab. Two, and essentially two ways. Rotting the cylinders is going to result in some amount of consolidation. What else are we going to do? See if you all remember. We're going to tap the sides, right? And tapping the sides is going to ensure that that concrete settles in and fills the rest of those entrapped voids. Remember, entrapped air, good, or bad. Entrained air, good. Again, I didn't get home like one in the morning yesterday, so I'm, <laughs> I'm allowed a little bit. Okay. So um, I, I included this image uh, for finishing because I, I really thought that this image gave you a nice sort of start to finish look at the placement project or process on a given application. I took this picture from the man lift uh, at the project in Iowa I mentioned earlier. And you can see that when they did concrete placement for this project, they started at one end, worked their way towards the other. <coughs> so, you can see here the, the wing walls. This was an integral abutment. Has anybody ever heard the term integral abutment before in bridge applications? If you haven't, an integral abutment is one where the ends of the girders are actually encased 
in the abutment and in the wing wall. And it's starting to gain a lot of traction in the bridge industry because you eliminate uh, deck joints and you have the potential to eliminate deck joints. Deck joints, they suck, okay? Because deck joints are going to collect water, they're going to collect gunk, they're going to collect moisture. And what that's going to do is cause corrosion, it's going to cause degradation, it's going to cause maintenance issues down the line. So <laughs> you're going to, um, you all, when you start to see a lot of new bridge construction uh, throughout your, your careers, you're probably going to see more integral, my prediction is you're going to see a lot more integral abutments than you are traditional ones. That, that's just my opinion. But <laughs> going to this, uh, going back to this image, you can see how it's been cast from start to finish. Uh, if you see this, uh, if you see this sort of, uh, metal sort of triangular truss element here. Um, if you've been on a larger scale uh, bridge project, you've probably seen a machine called a bidwell. It's a little larger, and, and it's usually and what it's what it does is it goes along the bridge and it sets your deck elevation. Okay. If you ever look at, at a uh, a concrete uh, deck on a bridge, it's not flat. Okay. There's usually a little bit of a a curve on it or a little crown on it, and, and we do that to make the the hydraulics folks happy because when it rains, we want that water to drain off the bridge. So we, we set a little crown. <laughs> this, um, this, this metallic sort of truss thing you see right here is essentially it's got that shape to it. And this one, this one was, a, for this project, it was pretty, uh, pretty rudimentary setup. But you essentially had a line running down the bridge. And this thing had a little motor attached to it. It just sort of pulled it on down the bridge and set the elevation. Now, when you do that, OK, you get that crown surface, but it's kind of rough. You're going to have little aggregate pockets sticking out. You're going to have little, you know, dips in it. It's going to be kind of rough. What you have to do is you have to actually finish that surface. That's where, you know, you're taking a trowel and smoothing it out, or maybe you're roughening it out, depending upon your given application. But that's what finishing is. Finishing is taking your placed concrete, once it has been consolidated, to fill all those, void, those voids, and finishing the surface to obtain either a smooth surface or whatever surface that uh, is intended for your given project. For this, what was done, it's kind of difficult to see. This guy had to go out a little bit to fill in some voids uh, out here. But you can see, everybody see this sort of long, this will look like a long broom type thing. Everybody see that? That's called a bull float, OK? So what the uh, workers can do is they can stand here on this, uh, this elevated walkway, and they can extend that out and sort of slowly, it's almost like you're sweeping, and they can smooth out the surface. Okay, so they've done that uh, on both sides of this bridge, but can you kind of see how this side looks like a little rougher? Everybody kind of see that? What they did for this uh, pro uh, project is they didn't want just a smooth surface. This is a road, and they wanted the road to have a little bit of grip to it, if you will. So the reason why this uh, surface on the left side is a little rough is because once they had smoothed it, they actually took it, it looked like a little broom, like it had a broom, it had small little wire pegs sticking out of it. What they did is they sort of dragged that on to create these little successive grid lines down the length of the bridge to give the, the surface a little bit more texture, okay, because that was its application. Now, like, for instance, if you go to the, the materials lab in the old building, which you all are going to go into in about an hour, they didn't do that. They just floated it, and that's it. <laughs> so just, just so you know, you can kind of see the, the, the full picture from start to finish. But I mean, looking past this, this uh, finishing machine, I mean, look what they're doing. Placing the concrete, consolidating, finishing, floating, so on and so forth. You can see the process uh, from start to finish. Pretty nifty picture, if I do say so myself. Um, so like I said, finishing. Uh, is trying to get that surface uh, filled in. Usually the first step of uh, finishing is screeding. Okay? And there are a number of different ways you can screed. Uh, if you've ever done any concrete work ever by hand, you've probably done manual screeding. Usually you take something like a 2 by 4 or anything with a level surface, and you're dragging it along the surface, and usually doing it in a sawing motion to kind of get all that excess concrete off into a essentially a, 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 a set elevation. If you want a... Um, uh, uh, a formalized definition of, of screeding, it's striking off all that excess concrete to achieve a desired elevation or a desired thickness or, or desired geometry. Okay? <laughs> Let's see. In fact, um, 
it wasn't in this, or yeah, yeah it was. Um, this is me doing uh, the uh, consolidation. There was another graduate student here and here. He's not pictured right there. But they were sort of going in behind me and sawing that off and, and, uh, and screening off to get that uh, desired thickness. <coughs> um, now, screening, um, uh, screening manually is obviously the most common approach uh, for, for most smaller scale applications. There are also um, a, a, a host of automatic or mechanical means of screening. So for instance, this is uh, uh, an operator who's using a vibratory screed. I have a, I think I have a couple videos of vibratory screening. I mean, and it goes from uh, as simple as this to as complicated as this, okay? This is a laser screed, and this is... Let me turn the sound on, on this one. You can even interface these like total stations and get your elevation set. Now, this is if you've got a really critical application and you need to really control your elevation. You can see it takes a lot of the guesswork out of the situation. So, uh, now, you, you're paying a, for obviously a heavier premium for this, but it depends on your application. Maybe you need it, you know. Look how much concrete they're placing. This is doing uh, uh, the leveling and finishing process for them a lot faster than they could do themselves. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, this might be an industrial application. So, uh, for instance, if you're designing, uh, let me, let me pause it. So, let's say you're designing uh, a facility that's going to be used as a factory, and you've got to have controlled elevations because you're manufacturing equipment. Let's say you're manufacturing a um, microprocessors or something, and you've got to have tightly controlled elevations. You know, that, that's a that's a given application. I'm going to be talking. I'm going to be talking about different concrete products later. So, like for instance, um, I think everybody could probably envision a scenario where lightweight concrete is desirable if you're trying to reduce superstructure weight. When do you think you'd ever want to use heavyweight concrete? Yeah. You know, what's that? Ah, uh, not really. Um, in fact, probably one of the, the, the most uh, critical applications of heavyweight concrete is in a nuclear facility. Or if it's a hospital wing or something like that. Actually having heavyweight concrete in order to provide a more effective barrier for radiation or something like that, that would actually be a pretty desirable application. You, you see what I mean? So it, it just depends. There's a whole host of different reasons why you could use this. And ultimately, one very simple, straightforward reason why you would want to use this equipment is this right here. If you can finish that surface with less labor and less time, and the costs work out in the end, use it every time. You know what I mean? That's the long and short of it. So, those are good questions, though. Good questions. All right. So, there's my, my laser level. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. <laughs> Now, once you're finishing, like I said, you can use a, a, a trowel or, like I said, you know, the large handle, uh, uh, a bull float, Let's, or a lar uh, large span bull float. Have you all ever seen power floating done? So you, it kind of, uh, you know, you can have ones that you even ride, but you can have one that kind of look like a, a, a lawnmower with a fan on the front of it, but they're essentially doing the same thing. I think I have a, a video of a 
powerful at being run. And so, yeah, yeah, here's one. Ooh, I gotta use some WD-40 on that. Yeah, you can see what that's done is making the, the, the finishing process uh, a little easier. So, like I said, there's handheld ones, there's even ones you can ride, so. Uh, oh, I like lawnmowers, so. Yeah, I'm not gonna sit there and watch that for for minutes and minutes. Okay. Any other questions so far? This is good stuff. I like this. Okay. Last step and the last thing that you need to uh, address with a successful concrete placement is curing. Okay. Now, the general gist of curing is to try and control the temperature and the moisture content that's present in your mix. Okay. Now, we can do this in the lab. Uh, it would require us to mix a little bit more concrete, and I, I really don't see too much uh, value in that. I just think it's going to be a little bit more of a hassle. But I can just give you the general gist of it. Okay? If you take two cylinders that we cast today in the lab, okay, you take one of them and you cure them in a water bath with controlled temperature and controlled moisture, and you take another one and you cure it just on the table in there, okay, and you test them both after 28 days, and assuming you know statistical variations and all that is out the window, you are going to find that the moist cured sample is going to perform better. It's going to have a higher compressive strength and higher ductility, period. Okay? Just is what it is. Okay? <laughs> so what we're trying to do is not only co um, uh, control the moisture in a given uh, uh, concrete placement, but also the temperature. You know, if you get temperatures that are too cold for a given placement, well, that's usually not good either. I mean, um, we, we generally try and avoid, for instance, casting concrete decks, let's say, in the middle of February, you know, outside. We try and avoid that, okay? Uh, concrete gets too cold. There's water in there. Water can freeze. You can get ice crystals that can change your consistency of your mix, and that's not good, okay? So typically, we try and keep most concrete placements throughout the year to be done in the spring, summer, you know, construction season, right? Remember, there's only four seasons in West Virginia, right? Snow, more snow, rain, and road construction, so. What? Well, yeah. But we generally try and, uh, try and, and keep concrete, I mean, critical concrete placements. I mean, you know, it's, you know, if you're casting a, a, a 12 foot deep pre-stressed concrete element, that's one thing, then that's different than filling a pothole, you know. So it's just something to keep in mind. What happens when cold? That's a good question. Um, and in those applications as an engineer, what I would say is try and utilize precast construction as much as you can. In precast construction, your concrete placement is being done in a controlled precast plant, okay? In that environment, they are able to control the temperature, control the humidity, control uh, all of those applications far better than we could in the field. Now, granted, you're going to have to grout some things and, and, and do some concrete finishing at the end to sort of join everything together, but most of your load-resisting elements are going to have far superior performance and behavior than if you just poured it in the, in the field. Yeah, exactly. Like if you look at a par the parking garage over on 3rd Avenue, that's very tinker toy. You know, all the elements are pre-cast, and they just put it together and finish it, put it together. That's, that's basically how that performs. So that's a, that's a great point. Uh, so the sample that's tested in the lab is going to be stronger than what's actually on the field? Um, to an extent, but when we say curing, what, what we're trying to do is maintain the moisture and the temperature that's present in a given placement, and there are ways to do that. For instance, those of you that have done DOH work or been on any uh, bridge construction projects, what do they do to the, uh, uh, what do they do, what's the last thing they do with the deck after they have placed the deck, consolidated it, finished it, you know, screeded it, bolt loaded it, what's the last thing they do? Not just burlap, wet burlap, right? Everybody, everybody's seen that, right? They do that for a specific reason. They are trying to 
uh, in, uh, contain as much of that moisture inside that mix as possible. And that's why they do that, okay? So when I say curing, I mean, yeah, the, the ones that we are doing in the lab are in sort of laboratory ideal conditions, but we are trying to achieve that as much as we can uh, in the field. Great points. Any other questions? This is good stuff. All right. So generally, the approach to curing, you know, we, we generally have three approaches. Okay. Number one, we can try and keep the moisture and the water that's in the placement. We try and maintain that uh, presence as much as we can. Two, we can try and seal it so that the water that's in the mix doesn't escape. The third is we can apply heat or additional moisture. I can tell you right now, the third one is not very common, but that's typically going to be the process if you're working at a precast plant. Because there, you're in a controlled scenario and they can actually apply heat. They can actually apply additional moisture because that's what they're doing. That's their, their job. It's a little difficult to do that uh, out in the field. So you know, method number one or method number two is probably going to be your, your more uh, appropriate application out in the field. And arguably method number one, uh, for instance, using like the covered burlap, that's going to be your, your most common application. <coughs> so method number one, try to maintain the presence of the water. It, it's usually the best approach. You're going to have to uh, apply, you're usually going to have to apply water periodically. You can see a worker, he's spraying the, uh, the deck to sort of uh, uh, keep the moisture uh, intact. This is what you're going to see uh, most common in bridge construction. And the method to, one of the most common methods to do that is to apply a wet covering, like a burlap or a cotton uh, covering or something like that. That's what we do uh, a lot here uh, in West Virginia. Um, <coughs> so this is kind of what that can look like at the end. This is the image I took from that project in Iowa I mentioned. That was the last thing they were doing, was they were applying that burlap and, and wetting that down to, uh, to cure that deck. Second method is to try and seal the surface. Maybe um, you know, try and uh, seal it with some membrane forming compound. Maybe leave the forms as is. Uh, use some plastic sheeting or something like that. The difference is with a burlap, we're trying to keep applying moisture. With something like a plastic sheeting or a sealant, what we're trying to do is keep that moisture that's already in the mix. We're trying to seal that in. Honestly, it's usually not as effective, but uh, it can have some, uh, um, some significant applications. Maybe if you're in a really hot environment or a really warm environment and you're worried about a lot of water evaporating, it might be uh, uh, more effective in those scenarios. Um, <coughs> here you can see sealers being applied and then also, like I said, plastic sheeting. Last one is, like I said, applying heat and additional moisture. Really not as effective out in the field. That's really, though, what you're going to see in a precast plant because in their, you know, manufactured controlled settings, they can make that work. They can add steam. They can insulate. They can use heating coils to ensure that the concrete is at a uniform temperature. They can do that in that scenario. Kind of tough to do that on a uh, bridge deck out in Wayne County or something. So, well, I mean, it's the truth. I mean, field applications are going to be a little more uh, tricky for something like this. But this is one of those, what are the three methods of curing celebratory questions that, that might get asked. Oh, no, everybody's like, I can hear the pens click. All right, any questions? OK, since we're here, and since I'm canceling class on Tuesday, I'm going to go on with my last sort of concrete lecture, and I, and I want to talk about some properties of hardened concrete, okay? In other words, once the concrete is cured, once it's placed, once all that stuff is done, there are important parameters that we need to understand. We are going to assess one of the most fundamental parameters of hardened concrete throughout the semester, and that is determining a concrete's compressive strength, okay? It's FC prime. If you take concrete design, you will get sick of seeing that term because you'll see it every day, right? Am I right? You're also going to see some familiar stuff from concrete design here in a second. So for those of you that have had concrete design, I don't want to say you can sleep through this, but you've seen some of it. Okay. So what I want to talk about now is 
the properties of hardened concrete, and then some alternative types. And by, by alternative types, I mean not your standard mixes, your self-consolidating concretes, your shot creeps and stuff like that. I'm sure you all have heard of that stuff, right? Uh, I, I do want to mention some of this. Um, I want to review some fundamental basic properties like creep, like shrinkage, like permeability. You know, it's Young's modulus. How do you determine Young's modulus for concrete? How do you determine its compressive strength? So on and so forth. All right. I do want to talk about all of this, but I, if there is any one thing about concrete that I hope you obtain from your civil engineering degree, it is this. Concrete, he's laughing because he knows exactly what I'm going to say. Concrete is a material that behaves very well in compression and very poorly in tension. Concrete likes to be pushed on, but pulling on it. Why do we place reinforcement in concrete to increase its resistance to tension? That's it in a nutshell. When you take reinforced concrete design, that's what we're doing. We are essentially designing a combination of concrete and steel systems where we are primarily using steel in the places where concrete is experiencing tension. That's it. When you look at the modulus of rupture for concrete, it's usually about 10% of its compressive strength. We're going to look at that uh, in the lab as well as analytically uh, here in a little bit. Okay, well, let's talk about some, some properties associated uh, with placed concrete, just, you know, just general, I'd say, non-quantitative properties, at least for, for our purposes. Some of this stuff you can quantify, uh, but we're not going to worry about that uh, in here. First off, change in volume. Okay? When you cast concrete from initial casting to its final set, final cured and in-service condition, the volume will change. Okay? Guaranteed. Um, for regular old reinforced concrete, it doesn't really matter. But in pre-stressed concrete, it can matter a whole lot. Do you all know what I mean by pre-stressed concrete? Has anybody ever heard of that term? You know what I mean by it? It's, it's okay if you don't. Pre-stressed concrete is where you're taking uh, you know, high-capacity steel tendons and trying to lock in forces inside a, a, a reinforced concrete element. Usually what our, our, our goal is, well, usually it always is our goal, is we try and lock in compressive forces inside a, re, uh, a reinforced concrete element. And the idea is, well, if concrete is a material that behaves very poorly in tension, if we can lock in some compression, we can cancel some stuff out, and we can ultimately use a lighter, more slender shape. That's pre-stressed concrete in a nutshell. Now, one of the complexities of pre-stressed concrete as to how to account for losses, okay? When you pre-stress an element, you're pre-stressing, you're putting like two, three hundred kips on it. I mean, you're putting some serious amount of force on it, okay? Now, that's on day one when you pre-stressed it. Twenty years down the line, you think all that 200, 300 kips is going to be still in that beam? No, you're actually going to, you're going to incur some losses uh, throughout its design life. There is a difference between uh, the pre-stress that you apply on day one and the pre-stress that you can assume effective for design. One of the most fundamental uh, computations in pre-stress concrete is how to determine pre-stress losses. And pre-stress losses come from a variety of different sources. One of them is shrinkage. When the volume of your element changes, that's going to change the geometry altogether and ultimately it change uh, the, the amount of force that you have. I mean, think, if you're applying this compressive force and then it shrinks, that force is probably going to go down a little bit. So something to keep in mind. Another one is creep. Have you ever heard of creep? Like, yeah, Dr. Mike, he's a creep. <laughs> oh, Lord. I love this job. <laughs> it's a blast. Um, creep. <laughs> creep is a... Um, a, a, a mechanical phenomenon. It might have been mentioned in Engineering 216 before. I'm not sure. But um, creep is, is kind of weird because it violates what you learned in, in mechanics and materials, what you're about to learn in structural analysis. It sort of violates all those principles. What we learn in mechanics and materials and what you do in structural analysis 
all hinges on one basic principle. When you apply load, it deforms. When you take that load off, it goes back. The load and deformation are related to one another. Creep is what happens when you have continued deformation, but the load doesn't change. The load stays exactly where it is, but it continues to deform. That can happen in concrete. A very uh, simple, kind of a gross example, is to look at like chewing gum. Imagine, okay, I got a piece of chewing gum in my mouth. Imagine if I took that piece of chewing gum and I you know, hung a small weight off of it. Then I left the room and I came back an hour later. You can sort of visualize that that weight would just sort of just sort of stretch out a little bit. Under a constant load, it would incur deformation. The deformation would keep increasing. That's called creep. Okay? There's a phenomenon that happens in the reverse where you can have the same length, but the actual force goes down, and we call that relaxation. You go, well, how the heck can that happen? Who plays guitar or bass or something like that? What do you have to do to your guitar every couple weeks to the strings? You have to keep tightening the strings, but the length doesn't change. From a mechanics perspective, if the length stays the same, the force should stay the same. But over time, those, those strings relax and the force goes down. Force goes down, your note changes. So you have to keep applying tension in order to counter that, counter that effect, right? That's called relaxation. The opposite of that is creep. All that stuff happens in pre-stressed elements and it can incur losses. You have to account for that uh, throughout its design life. Okay, permeability, um, it's just something that we hope doesn't happen, at least from a structural engineering standpoint. We usually ensure that our mixes uh, can account for that in some way or another, either through maybe some admixtures or just controlling your water cement ratio. If you have high permeability, it's usually a problem from a load capacity standpoint. Um, <laughs> maybe it didn't consolidate it as well. Maybe you threw too much water into the mix. Don't throw excess water. Don't just add water. Don't do it. Um, but it can have a lot of problems. Um, it reduces your durability. It increases the chance that you can get uh, 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 basic elements and, 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 uh, and you know, sulfates and salts and things like that into your, uh, into your concrete, which can cause degradation and corrosion uh, down the line. Um, your freeze-thaw uh, resistance uh, gets screwed up. So high permeability is something we really don't like. Now, it also depends on the application. I mean, if, you're, if this is just like flowable fill for, let's say, a backfill behind an abutment, who, who cares? You know, we just want material there, okay? So it just depends on, on uh, your application. Now, okay, let's talk about mechanics. Let's talk about stress-strain relationship. Like I said, these are, these are stress-strain curves. As your water-cement ratio goes up, your compressive strength goes down. Now just so everybody's clear with what I mean with compressive strength, everybody in this room should know what a stress-strain curve is, right? Everybody should know what a stress-strain curve is. Compressive strength is the largest compressive stress that you get on your stress-strain curve. Here's your cylinder, compress it, whatever the largest stress is, that's FC prime. When I say compressive strength and FC prime, I mean the same thing. That's your largest, uh, uh, that's your largest uh, stress that you achieve from a stress strain test. Um, one other aspect of uh, uh, water cement ratio is as your water cement ratio goes up, your stiffness goes down. And what I mean by that, when I say stiffness, I'm not talking about its maximum capacity. If, if you want an easy answer, when I say stiffness, I'm really talking about its Young's modules, its elastic modules. As your water cement ratio goes up, that initial slope, that, that slope is going down. So if I had two pieces of concrete, one had a really high cement ratio, or water cement ratio, one had a really low one, the one with the high water cement ratio, it will deform more under the same load. Okay? That makes sense? So again, don't let the contractor throw extra water in the mix. Don't do it. Okay. One other aspect of uh, uh, concrete is that as your compressive strength goes up, your ductility goes down. So if you have a concrete that's got you know, eight KSI compressive strength, that's got a lot of strength. It will achieve a lot of, it will be able to withstand a lot of stress. But when it fails, it will fail in a very brittle fashion. When it goes, it'll go. Whereas if you've got like one KSI concrete, you know, some really weak concrete, 
When it fails, it will fail in a very gradual, extended fashion. You won't get that sudden, dramatic failure. So it's a trade-off. It's physics. There's really not a lot you can do about it. As compressive strength goes up, your ductility will go down. So that's just something to keep in mind. Sound good? All right. Mr. Gunnels, what's the deal with this? Yes, I am. What's the deal with that? Anybody who's had me for concrete design, what's the deal with that? You put in PSI and you get out PSI. Okay. No, no, that's fine. But you know, you remember now. Okay. So, concrete is a material that is highly nonlinear. Okay. It does not conform to a linear stress strain curve. But if we're doing mechanics computations, if we need to do deflection calcs or something like that, we need a Young's modulus. We need an E value. We've got to use something. Okay? ACI has a, a, a number of what I'm calling empirical models that we can use to compute uh, some of these quantities. Now, what I mean by empirical is this. Um, Mechanics-based equations are stuff we can derive. You know, throw a few parameters on the board, slap a couple integrals on it, and we can get an answer. Okay? That's a, me a mechanics-based equation. An empirical equation is actually coming up with a mechanics-based approach to determine Young's modulus is really tough. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down to the lab, we're going to test about 500 cylinders, we're going to throw it into Excel and see if we can come up with an equation that closely fits the data. That's what I mean by an empirical expression. So one of the, the, the downsides of using empirical expressions is sometimes they can come out a little strange. The, the units don't work out. And you look at it and it you know, freaks you out. Like, for instance, compressive strength is in PSI, but so is Young's modulus. So how do you take the square root of a stress and get a stress? It's empirical. I, I understand the units don't work. It's, it's curve fit data. It's finding an equation that fits the results in the lab as close as possible. When you take concrete design, or even in here, because we're going to use some of these equations for homeworks, when you see a square root of F sub prime, the unit, if, for those of you that go nuts on units, this will drive you crazy. Just remember, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. So if I got four KSI concrete, I would take 57,000 times the square root of four? No, square root of 4,000. Put in PSI and you will get out PSI. Sound good? Okay, so just something to keep in mind. Okay. All right, got a few more minutes. Okay, testing. We need to perform tests to assess the quality and properties of a given batch of concrete. There's two different ways we can go about that. We can do destructive tests, which are my favorite. Again, any day with controlled demolition is a good day. We can also do non-destructive testing. And sometimes, for a given application, non-destructive testing might be more appropriate. I mean, if you need to determine the in-service condition of a given concrete placement, you know, C4 is usually not the best way to do it. <laughs> I'm kidding, but, but uh, I'm really trying to make a good point. If you have an in-service application and you need to assess its properties and actually you're know, performing a destructive test isn't an option, well, there are non-destructive tests that are available like ultrasonics and, and, and things like that. You need to uh, make sure that you have an understanding of that. Now, obviously, the most common destructive tests available to us to assess concrete is the stress strain test, particularly on a cylinder. Take a cylinder, boom, compress it until failure. <laughs> um, you really usually only have two options with concrete cylinder testing, either a six inch diameter cylinder or a four inch diameter cylinder. And honestly, four inch diameter cylinders are becoming a lot more common nowadays. You, you really don't get terribly different quality assurance and, and results from a six inch cylinder as opposed to a four inch cylinder, and all you're doing is wasting material. If you can get the same quality assurance from a smaller cylinder, just, just do it, right? So that's what we're going to be using in the lab. Um, ASTM has regulations on uh, the limits on you know, what cylinder you can use for what application. You can't use a, a, a four inch cylinder if you've got aggregate that's too large. If you have really large coarse aggregate, 
you're not going to, I mean, think, if you've got a, a two-inch, you know, diameter maximum aggregate size, a four-inch cylinder probably doesn't make a lot of sense. So, <clears throat> in that instance, you probably need to go with a, a six-cylinder. Anybody, a six-inch cylinder, anybody do any cylinder testing over the summer? Did you do mostly what, fours or sixes? Really? Where, uh, do you, did you notice if there was any difference between like what jobs you were doing six inch cylinder testing versus four, like, or did you know? Okay. <laughs> okay. We can be a goofy bunch. Case in point, you know. <laughs> Exhibit A. Okay. Um, I'm going to cover this and then I'm going to call it because we do have to get ready for lab. Um, if compressive strength, if FC prime, is a measure of a uh, concrete ability to withstand compression, its modulus of rupture, F sub R, is a measure of its ability to withstand tension. Typically, the modulus of rupture is about 10% of the concrete strength. It's not always, but it's about that. And there's two ways of doing that. One of them is to actually perform what's called a split cylinder test. You actually take the cylinder, set it on its side, and test it in that fashion. And you can use mechanics to, to determine the modulus of rupture. This one I don't think is as common nowadays as this, which is what we're going to do, which is test a beam. Now, we are testing uh, a beam in what's called four-point bending. When I say four-point bending, I mean there's two reactions and two point loads. Okay? There is a reason that we are testing the beam in this fashion. Okay? Let's see if the pen works. Wait, maybe I need to turn editing on. I'm going to show you all this because it's structures and I can't help it. All right. Hold on. It's the first step in drawing the moment diagram. You draw the shear diagram. What would the shear diagram for this look like? It would go up, over, down, over, down, over, up. That would be the shear diagram. So when you draw the moment diagram, you would get, okay, what would you get from here to here? It would be linear, nothing, linear, okay? The reason for performing the test in this fashion is because in the middle you have constant moment, okay? Make sense? Okay. Fundamental bending stress, sigma equals my over i. Our modulus of rupture would be my over i. The moment, if you go through and do the math, you will find that this moment occurs at P, bless you, PL over 6. Okay. Um, the moment of inertia of a rectangle is BH cubed over 12. It's centroid, it's halfway up. Plug and chug, there's your modulus of rupture. Make sense? Not too bad, right? All right. I'm tired of talking, and we're close to time anyway. So I'm going to give you all about 15 minutes, 2 o'clock. We're going to get started.